All right, welcome everybody. We're gonna get started. Thanks for bearing with us here. Um, so glad that y'all could join us tonight. My name's Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, we're excited to host this discussion tonight about the lives of people who trade sex um, and a new book from PM Press, Working at Sex Workers uh, on the Work of Sex. So Firestorm is a 14 year old, really 15 at this point. I think we're we're like down to the last couple of weeks of 14. So 15 year old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. Uh, we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized people in the South. We're also continuing to do a lot of our events like this one uh, virtually so that people can join from a distance. Um, which is something that we feel really passionate about, both in terms of accessibility um, geographically and also uh, because of the COVID pandemic. So if you're interested in signing up for future events, uh, follow us on social media, and I'll also share a link to our newsletter in the chat. So please note that tonight we are using Zoom's Q&A tool. Um, if you wanna ask a question at any point, you can uh, pull up the little tool at the bottom of your screen, and we will come back to all those questions at the end. Um, or if you're on Facebook, uh, you can use the comment section on the stream. Okay, so we're gonna get started. Uh, tonight, we're joined by working at ed uh, editor Matilda Bickers and contributors Camille and Monty. Uh, Matilda is an artist and writer originally from Boston South End. Her experience in sex work uh, which she entered at age 18, has enabled her to focus on art and activism and the vital intersection of the two. She's performed her written work at the Radar Reading Series in San Francisco and with Sister Spit in Portland, Oregon. Vickers has worked to create spaces to amplify and showcase the creative work of others, uh, from working at a quarterly zine of sex worker art and writing to the annual Portland Sex Worker Art Show. Vickers is currently um, writing Aspiration Risk, a novel about her ongoing attempt to leave the sex trades for a career in healthcare and the painful parallels between the two industries. Camille has numerous honames, but currently goes by Move a Dragon on the internet. She lives in the Carolinas um, as a queer mother in a marriage between two loving Aquariuses. She's the daughter of an abolitionist and a drug dealer turned truck driver and granddaughter of a former field hand and an army veteran, the great granddaughter of an enslaved mother of 13 and great great granddaughter of a midwife. She loves her lineage and her proximity to royalty and embodies her ancestral power in all she does when she can. Monty Monster Slayer was a dancer for four years and an artist out of the womb. Monty's art transforms her bitter and humorous energies into a celebration of women's strength and beauty. Unbeknownst to them, the actions of swine-like sex customers and critics would become fodder for her pieces, which elevate the female form and experience through representational figurative art. It's such a pleasure to have you all here. Um, this is a fantastic book, uh, and I know we're all gonna enjoy getting to hear a conversation tonight about it. So I'm gonna pass off to you, Matilda, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm so pleased to have you, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, so yeah, I edited Working It. I started Working It as a zine um, eight years ago now, I think, in 2015. Um, I was kind of in the middle of suing my club and um, for, well, actually, let me start with a trigger warning. We're gonna be talking about um, my lawsuit against my club and also um, Monty Monster Slayers. Um, struggles with her club and with sexual assaults in the club and the issues of assault and battery against dancers and dancers lack of rights. So just a trigger warning that that is gonna be part of the discussion tonight. Um, and I wanted to let you all know about that. So um, yeah, that was happening when I started working it. I was suing my club and I transitioned from dancing into full service sex work. Um, and I got this grant to do street outreach with um, street-based sex workers and houses people in Portland, Oregon. And part of the grant covered this zine to um, showcase sex workers writing and art. And so I did the zine for 
five years. And in 2020, in the beginning of the pandemic, PM Press reached out to me and they were like, we want to publish an anthology of looking at, um, would you be interested in that? And of course I was like, hell yes. And, you know, everything had changed so radically from the time that I started working in 2015 to 2020, and of course to now. So I solicited new pieces um, and I reached out to all these people who I thought, you know, we don't usually get a platform. Like usually the people that get platformed are, you know, escorts, fancy escorts, people with money and, and who already have a platform, you know, let's be honest, thin, cis, white women, white strippers. And I really wanted to not like repeat that process. So I reached out to a whole bunch of people and we put together working it. And two years later, here it is. And it's so, so exciting. So um, I'll hand it over to Camille next and Camille can introduce herself and then Monty. Hi y'all, um, my name is Camille. I am a retired stripper, current cam girl, constant organizer and a doula in my area. Um, my bio is slightly inaccurate. I am now a single mom, lol. <laughs> but outside of that, everything else was spot on. Um, I am really proud of my lineage. And um, as Matilda pointed out, the intersections between healthcare and sex work. Um, as a sex worker and to a doula, I relate very hard to all the intricacies and the what is the word intersections that lie between those two. Um, and I'm really excited to dive in with y'all and talk more about it. Go ahead, Monty. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Monty Monster Slayer Montgomery, but you can call me Monty. Um, I am uh, once retired and now re-entered dancer um, <laughs> uh, and an artist. So, um, I'm always painting and occasionally dancing uh, to support my, my nasty drawing habit. Um, <laughs> it was really wonderful when Matilda uh, contacted me during 2020 to do the cover of this book. Normally, I'm not a big fan of commissions. I get a lot of like, hi, can you paint my baby, I guess. And that's cute. That's so cute. I love that for you. Just normally I paint, you know, uh, the, the, as it was described, like the, the female experience or just a woman's experience, um, especially in the context of sex work. So when Matilda contacted me, I was like, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. I would so love to be a part of this project. And just seeing how it's all come out and reading all those stories. Ugh, what a gem. I'm so proud to be a part of it. I actually, let's start with that. Um, do you want to start talking about your billboard? I found Monty Monster Slayer because she made this billboard and I'll let her tell you about it because it was incredible. And I thought I need that person to be a part of the book. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, I was dancing in LA. I had, or I had tried getting out of uh, dancing once before um, and then awkwardly floundered in, you know, art adjacent jobs. My favorite is framing. Um, and, you know, I'd been, I'd been doing custom framing for like a couple of years when I decided to go back into dancing to gain money to do art fairs and, and further support my art career, which takes a lot of money uh, that I did not have. So I go back into dancing and got like a few, I don't know, a few months into it, um, a bouncer that I had trusted and known since the, the first time, first round of dancing, uh, yeah, asked for, a couple dances um, in a VIP room and sexually assaulted me. Um, and uh, yeah, my initial reaction was to just move on. Like it, it happens, I'm just gonna pretend, I'm gonna compartmentalize it, I'm going to dissociate and I'm just gonna keep it moving because I have a goal and if anybody stands in my way, it will be bulldozed or it does not exist. Um, but 
but as much as we want to shove down traumas, they will be asked, they will ask you to, um, to deal with them. So the pain really ate away at me for the next several months until I decided um, that I was just going to spray paint the fuck out of their building, to be honest with you, like the, uh, the, those feelings um, that I experienced of like, I don't know, being, I'm just going to use the R word, just everybody hold, like, hold on tight. Yeah. Um, being raped is, is just like a physical way of being told that like your no doesn't mean anything. Um, it's, it's a way of saying, you know, what you have to say doesn't matter. However you move, it doesn't matter. Like you were literally an object. Um, and that being imprinted on my body, um, it just turned into this like really intense fiery anger. Cause no, I'm, I'm absolutely not accepting that. I'm an intelligent, creative, passionate person. Um, and I think I have a lot to offer. So being put down in that way was infuriating. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I decided that I was going to absolutely destroy their building. Um, I called up a friend that was in the street art scene and asked him, uh, what are the legal repercussions of absolutely bombing? And bombing is, is a slang term to mean like, you know, tagging, spray painting a building. And he's like, he's a white guy. So he was like, excuse me, <laughs> like, who's my audience? It's a radical bookstore. Y'all are with me. Okay, we're cool. Um, he goes, he goes, if you just tell the officer like, oh, I'll, I'll paint right over it. I'm so sorry. You know, it's LA. Like, it's not like Texas where I, I'm, I grew up or where I'm living now where you will get a felony charge. Um, but he's like, just apologize and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, mm, okay, click. You know, he doesn't know that I'm planning on spray painting their plants and front door and like literally destroying their building. I call him back. Oh no, he calls me back. I don't remember who cares, honestly. Um, and he's like, he's like, no, actually you sound upset. Um, you're not just gonna spray paint. You're not just gonna put up a cute mural, you know? And, and I told him what was going on and he offered to help me put up a billboard instead over, over months of, of deliberating and like thinking back and forth, what should the concept be? Um, we decided on being good little girls and boys and you know paying for a billboard so that this image would ride and you know it would ride for like it rode for two months instead of a tag which would be painted over and nobody would talk about it um nobody would be informed of what was happening in in that club um so i put up a billboard and i painted the face of my rapist and me ripping his head off <laughs> And uh, yeah, that, that billboard went up and um, a lot of articles were written about it and it kind of like kickstart a, a little offshoot of my art career. This um, is, I, this is probably not really good quality. I don't think. Yeah, it's not. I'm going to try. <laughs> yeah, you can kind of see it. Yeah, it's in the book. It's, it's incredible. Um. I mean, I could see it pretty well. Let me give it a second and I'll read it out loud, which is ugh, icky, but. It was just incredible. It made the news and I was just like this, like I need her in the book and also she needs to do the cover. I'd been struggling with like, what do you put on the cover? And I, you know, there's that famous image of the stripper in the courtroom bending over so that the judge can see that her labia are covered. And I was like, Monty Monster Slayer, will you? Will you paint this image for me? And yeah, it was, I'm so proud. Yes, of course. Yeah. And what a beautiful concept too. I, I'd never actually seen the image and I didn't know the story until you asked me to do the cover. And once I, I don't, once I read the story, I was like, yes, clearly <laughs> I will, like no doubt. But here's, here's a little closer, um, I wonder if, is it focused? Oh yeah, that shows it better than mine did, yeah. Yeah, so this is a painting, a self-portrait of me ripping his head off, um, saying, I'm Stephanie, I was raped by a guy like this in a place like that. I told the club and the police, but no one did anything, so I painted this billboard. 
I did, in fact, to fill everyone in on the story, I did, in fact, go to the management after this happened. She tried to give me hash money. Uh, I went to the LAPD and tried to report this rape. I was sent to like three different um, places. None of them really cared to take my report. And the one that finally did, the investigator, didn't really um, give a lot of attention to my report because I was a sex worker. So, you know, to those who don't know, um, the legal system picks and chooses who they support and keep safe. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that doesn't usually include sex workers. Um, it doesn't include people of color, Black people. It doesn't do a lot for women um, or people with disabilities. Like, yeah, you know, we could go on, but you get the idea. Yeah. It's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. I found that in one of the weird parallels with sex work in healthcare is that like, I don't know what your experience is with this is Camille, but like, we'll be warned, you know, don't go into that guy's room alone or don't see that patient alone. Always bring somebody else with you when you see that patient. But of course there's short staffing. There's never enough staff. So eventually you get like, you get put one-on-one -on -one with people who will assault you. And it's, I just, I can't believe that I am trying to leave the sex industry for another industry that treats its workers so poorly. Um, it's just so frustrating. Um, and then I was hoping that Camille would talk a little bit about your work in healthcare and your work um, in lobbying. Do you want to, what are you working on right now? Um, right now I'm very squarely focused on reproductive justice and like trying to sort through all the things we just talked about in my brain. Um, what a hard segue it feels like. Um, oh. <laughs> it was um, just, yeah, sexual assault, healthcare, healthcare, and lobbying. <laughs> what came up for me, what, what I was having a hard time forgetting is when the cops went to one of our local clubs here and outed every single stripper by first and last name in the newspaper because they found drugs on a random person, not even a dancer. Um, and as you guys know, as has already been said, the cops are not here for us by any means. They're usually some of the same people involved in our assaults. Um, so I hate to even think about the cops in relation to what we do here. Um, with the healthcare part though, which is its own little evil, I get to work in a part that makes me feel really actualized as an abolitionist. I get to be a doula in the South where we are extremely legislated against and extremely like bordering on illegal, not allowed in some hospitals still. Um, I think the pathway from being a stripper to working as a support person is like this. I know peer-to-peer -peer support like nobody else. I know uh, when you can use a sponge, when you should, when you should switch to a tampon, we should go put that cup in. And also, fun fact, um, before we had all of these like cotton products that we do have now, we really were literally, and when I say we, I mean like formerly enslaved folks and things like that, we're using cotton, literally cotton as a form of birth control. So we haven't come too far from the things that we already knew as a collective, as people. Um, when I think about the pathway too, um, I learned through Matilda, sex workers were oftentimes the healers of communities, which is not something I knew. Um, it is just a natural place for us as people who provide comfort, as people who provide conversation. And we're really good, even if we don't want to, I know how to make my money. So I know how to use eye statements, make eye contact, pretend I heard everything you just said, whatever you just said. <laughs> wow, so you wore that shirt for that? You look too good for that. Like, it is nothing. Um, I feel like if I worked more so in the nurse side, Matilda, if I worked inside the institution side, there would be a much more misalignment for me. But mm -hmm. inside the doula world, it is us against some parts of the medical system. In the best case scenario, we are working together. We are abolishing systems together. We are helping people achieve the outcomes that they want to be achieving in healthcare uh, in their their journey. But we know that's not what's happening inside some clinics, and inside some hospitals. And I, I love being on the outside, no matter how I make my point. Yeah. 
that's one thing that I was thinking about when Monty, you were talking about like doing sex work to support your art is how can we not, I guess not convenient, but kind of convenient. Like sex work is this way kind of around all of like the nine to five soul crushing jobs that we like have to work in to survive. It's not to say that sex work isn't like often traumatic or really shitty, but it also often is more money. It's more money than minimum wage and the hours are better. They're more flexible. We can set our own hours. And then you have this money that you can do whatever you want with. You can like train to become a doula and you can just fund your art. And it's so like that gets overlooked, I think, in a lot of conversations about sex work. Like people are like, why? What's a girl, nice girl like you doing in a place like this? And it's like, well, I'm funding my lifestyle. That's so <laughs> triggered <laughs> now. It's such a horrible <laughs> question. That we get asked so many horrible questions and it's yeah. like a script. It's so funny. Um, yeah, no, I was just talking to my uh, counselor about this, I think, earlier today, just while just like any other occupation, um, there are pros and cons, and this job is not for everybody. Um, but if you happen to be good at it, it comes with some benefits, which include, you know, a very flexible schedule. Um, and like you said, more money than a regular job. Um, and, and I've been on both ends, and I'm sure both of you have too. Um, I know, Matilda, you see your um, you know, you're trying to work in the medical field. So you probably have your scheduled times and your limited paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, um, yeah, I recently made the jump back into, uh, dancing and it was soul crushing for me, especially with someone who's dealing with, um, dealing with trauma and having to like, you know, just do the, do the vanilla face, um, mm -hmm. for the vanilla job. It is, uh, it's just not well suited pursuing art, which is what I'm here to be doing. Yeah. I had to go back in November of 2021 before I got my job and I bought myself nice shoes. I was like, all right, I'm very grown now. I'm not 21 and 18 anymore. I'm here to make rent. I have a child to feed. Like I'm here. And by two o'clock, I was literally on the bar, like with tears streaming down my face. I was so nauseous. I was like, okay, so I can't drink like I used to anymore. I'm so dizzy. And anytime a man speaks to me, I'm... <laughs> Let's talk about that. No. <laughs> and that was the last night I was able to be inside a club. I, I don't think I have gotten over my traumas at all. Uh, I'm sure it's no surprise, but dancing in the South, that's, it's one thing on its own. Then dancing in the South as a Black person, then dancing as a South, in the South as a queer person, then dancing in the South as a mother. Um, I danced pregnant. It was just, I don't have the words. I remember club managers being like oh you're my favorite I love you so much why you always want to listen to this music though you trying to get a shot up and I'd be like ha 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 no I just I just like Megan Thee Stallion I don't want a problem <laughs> um and when they get really comfortable when they really like you then they start using the n-word and it's a dungeon there is no social justice in the club there is no radical left in the club there is no praxis in the club it is simply what it is. And if you are not prepared to do something about it, then you have to go about getting your money. And I was never prepared. I was only there for, for my money mm -hmm. and my tears. Mm, baby. That's something that I think not a lot of people really want to talk about. You know, there's a whole conversation like among certain certain segments of the sex worker population where they're like, it's so empowering. It's so great. It's so radical. And it is, it can be those things. But it's also like it's still a customer service job and it's still, you know, the sex industry spaces are still catering. They're trying to cater to the most to the widest population of men. Right. So they're trying to get the most appealing to the widest person, widest population of men, the most appealing version of a sex worker. And it's so they don't want you to be threatening. They don't want you to be like you just have to be kind of a generic, easygoing 
dancer or, you know, or a sex worker. And it's just, it's really hard. It takes a toll, especially like once you start to be alert to all the power dynamics that are happening. And once you're just like, I'm not okay with these power dynamics, that's when it really, really starts to take a toll. And I always wonder, I'm like, I kind of have a theory that maybe you get faced with two options. It either takes its toll on you and you find, you find ways to leave, you know, you find other things to work on to throw your energy into, or and this, this is the only thing that explains some people that I can think of. You just embrace it. You're like, fuck this. Yes. I am embracing this patriarchal shit system wholeheartedly. Like if you don't make it up to pay your stage fee, that's on you. You know, like you didn't, I made it. What's wrong with you? And that can make it really hard to, to, not even organized for change, but to talk about change in the club, because how, with there, when there's no solidarity, what are you supposed to do? And that was, that was one thing that I really wanted to talk about in the book too, is just how hard it is to be in these spaces and to know that this stuff is wrong and to not be able to talk about it, you know, to not be able to talk about like getting assaulted or, you know, or to not be believed, like the, the lack of belief in like the assaults that happen in the club and the lack, the indifference, it's really hard. I don't like, we just, yeah, we just have to keep talking about it and struggling against it because, because there's otherwise it's just so soul crushing. It is. And it's tough to like, um, uh, get the idea across that it is both things. Like it is mm -hmm. both, it can be empowering. It can be, you know, um, I don't know, freeing. It also very much is like, a microcosm of kind of the worst mm -hmm. um, systems that we have in place. Yeah, uh, and and I I personally don't want to fall on an either or. I, it's really both. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, because there is there is like an embracing of the systems that are. Mm -hmm. And it almost feels like a caricature of it. <laughs> I feel like as a dancer, like I feel like a caricature of it. Um, and this like disgusting humor is the only way for me to cope. And that's really like how I make my art. That's where my art comes from. Is that like, <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? You know, <laughs> I love it so much. I love the disgusting humor. There reminds me of one of the very first issues of working it that I put out was called the opposite of sexy, just because I really wanted like to talk about and embrace all the ways in which this job is not sexy. You know, like, like when we're bending over being like, Hey, can you see my tampon string or, you know, all of just all of the ways in which we're dealing with bodies in a really intimate kind of grotesque way. I was giving this lap dance once and, you know, I kind of run my fingers along people's arms. Like I rub their hair and I was running my fingers down this guy's arm and I just felt this wetness and I accidentally scraped off all of these like pimple scabs that he had on his arm. And I just like, <laughs> it was just under my nails. It was just all this puff. And I was like, oh, this is going in the book. Like I have to illustrate, like just, yeah, I felt so bad too, but also, you know, like you just, you don't expect a ton of pimple scabs. You never see that coming. Muting myself, I'm like my whole like my. <laughs> we had alcohol in the back, and I just soaked my fingers in alcohol for a while. I was like, "This is fine, this is cool," and nobody believed me. But somebody else got a dance from him later and was like, "Oh, you are not joking." I said, "No, I wasn't. Like, I was dead serious. I was not exaggerating for effect. Like, this is real. It really happened." No body shaming. I'm sure that's like really tough to deal with pimples on your arms. It's yeah. just like, yo, we are not prepared for that, but no. you have to be, you like, you just, ha you just have to be like ready to roll with those punches. Yeah. When you bend over someone and you take a normal breath, cause you have to breathe oxygen, but then you have to breathe their oxygen and their smell, no body shape, but shower before you go to the club, shower yes. before you pick someone up. Yes, yes. We did. We had that. I don't know whether, like, I guess I get close, I get closer to people as a full service sex worker than I did as a dancer, really, you know, because I'm kissing people. And the the sheer amount of people who will come to me after having eaten garlic, and then will just quietly burp into my mouth. Is, <laughs> uh, sorry, this is about the radical imagination of sex workers, but it's also about the radical grotesqueness that we deal with on a daily basis. Speaking of radical imagination, 
we did talk a little bit about capitalism in the club. Can we talk about how regardless, we would still accidentally be pulling scabs off in a perfect leftist world? Yes, there is that. (laughs) I feel like it's something that comes up a lot in organizing for me. I'm in a lot of left circles um, and constantly find myself having to unfollow Instagram accounts of who I think are really radical, intersectional feminists, brown and black folks and then out of nowhere it could be a random Tuesday and here is this long four-page infographic on why sex work is not liberation work how it will not exist if Mm -hmm. everything is abolished if we get a just world a just justice oriented world there will not be sex work I assure you your favorite activist wants to pay a sex worker actual money in a perfect world, sex workers are not oppressed. Sex workers don't disappear. Sex workers just don't get what you're afraid of. Um, it's something I desperately wanted to talk about here because just in case, if any of the 22 people here came here thinking we wouldn't be here after they get what they want, go ahead and leave. It's It makes me crazy. I'm like, what, like, what is the world, I mean, what, after the revolution, what does the world look like to you? I'm really curious because all I hear is that sex work is going to exist, but they haven't talked about other things, like how needs are going to be met, you know, like, it's just, it's just such a swerve talking point. And I'm like, you're lacking in radical imagination, honestly. It's tough to um, uh, relate to that frame of thinking, but I mean, it's, I know it's there that that people are like they believe that sex workers are just oppressed right like the only reason that they're doing sex work is because they need money like there's only survival or coerced um Mm -hmm. sex work um but there are people there are people that are good at it and there are more people that want and need it Mm -hmm. um I think sex is sex and like um and sexual sensual services are extremely important I think for health in general yeah it's it turns out it's one of Maslow's basic needs I learned that in my nursing textbook (laughs) that's right it's a basic need and you know we're serving that um I saw that there was a question I'm just gonna check Q and A, not a question. Okay, we'll move on. <laughs> Does anyone watching have questions? Like, you know, you've all been so quiet so far. It looks like y'all can see the questions coming in, um, but I'll, I'll chime in and help out with that if that's all right. Um, yeah. yeah, we did. We did. We're starting to get them. And please, everybody, we do want your questions. So, um, Christy asked uh, for a little more about um, the piece on capitalism, um, uh, and this is kind of a specific thing. So I don't know if anybody has thoughts on this. It's uh, a question about um, uh, kind of the idea of sacred temple prostitution. Um, is that something that anybody is prepared to speak to? I don't really know a lot about it. Um, I think that it existed, but that was not my area (laughs) in school. I'm sorry. I wish I could answer you. Christy, if you have thoughts on that. Oh, go ahead, Camille. No, I just want a crumb of context for what sacred temple prostitution is. I have no idea. Oh, it was, there were, you know, some goddesses, I mostly know about this, like, actually, I can't think of a specific culture, but I know that there were specific cultures where there were priestesses who, you know, on specific holidays, they would have sex with, with, you know, people who came, temple worshipers who came in. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it. I remember reading about it like 10 years ago in um, a a pre-biblical literature class that I took in my undergrad. So it was very minimal. Hmm. But it was real, it, like it really existed. If anybody who's uh, in the audience has more information and wants to share, please feel free to. Um, I guess I'll, I'll ask a question and then we've got a few more coming in. Um, so uh, today is tax day. You know, we, we chose today, especially because it was tax day, you know, a really important day <laughs> to have this conversation. 
Um, but but there is, I think there's a relevant topic here, right? You know, tax day is a day where a lot of people are like settling up and figuring out what they're putting into social security. Um, and I guess I'd love to hear a little bit more about how systems like social security leave out sex workers and what um, sex workers have done or are doing in order to create kind of like alternative uh, systems for mutual aid and support um, when they're excluded from systems like social security? That's such a good question. And um, there's so many, like, especially since COVID, there's so many sex worker mutual aid projects that have cropped up because, um, you know, unemployment actually was expanded to cover sex workers, but a lot of people didn't know that or they weren't able to access it or unemployment was so patchy, you know, that it didn't work out or wasn't enough. Um, so yeah, since COVID, there have been a lot of mutual aid projects. I think sex workers are really, I don't want to, I'm probably, um, what's the word? I'm probably overgeneralizing, but I do think that sex workers are some of the founders of mutual aid. Like there's this really great book about sex workers in Kenya. Um, and it talks about how sex workers would pool their resources and they would take care of each other. Like if somebody got hurt or injured or couldn't work anymore, or if like somebody died, they would take care of their, they, they would pool resources and take care of their families. Um, and then that book is called The Comforts of Home by Louise White. And um, it's about sex work in colonial Kenya. And then there's another book about sex workers in 18th century England, where sex workers would do the same thing. They would pool their resources and take care of their you know, comrades who got hurt or injured. Um, and I'm sure that other groups did this too, but I just think that there's a long history, a documented history of sex workers doing this because, you know, yeah, there's, there's no retirement plan. <laughs> and I'd only add that we have come up with so many different forms of mutual aid now too. Like as often as there is like a stripper fund, there's also people like hustle and hackling, wait, hack hustling I and hacking. <laughs> um who do incredible work doing like cyber tech and like digisec and just general taking care of yourself on the internet for people who were sex workers are sex workers and even further abroad people who do gender affirming care stuff like that because we are in a under the threat of surveillance uh the same news that tighten around sex workers next is tightening this year for regular vanilla folks um that digisec surveillance that weird time of which we are being um, restricted in this way of how we make money, how we talk about it on the internet, all of these things. It was unique to sex workers, I feel like 2013, 2014, um, and now it's all of us. Mm -hmm. And Christy kind of chime back in with a little more information on um, the earlier question about temples um, and noted that Greco-Roman ancient practice of unpaid sexual experience with the living embodiment of goddesses and probably non-binary deities as well. Um, and another person, um, Mary, shared uh, that um, temple sex work, uh, according to Mary, is controversial among scholars, including feminist scholars, it's mentioned in the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew Bible. Um, male prostitutes were thrown out during the reign of King Josiah, and it's postulated in other cultures in the Middle East. So we've got we've got an audience that's really has a lot of information, which is awesome. Um, thanks to everybody who's sharing. A question from Hannah, which I think is a really good one, um, is about kind of talking to folks about sex work. So Hannah shares. Um, that they were really upset to have a conversation with a close friend and learned that she thought all sex work in porn was inherently misogynistic. Um, and Hannah asks, I wonder if y'all have any advice on how to talk to her. Um, I mean, I think, I think she has a point in that it's like, a, it's a product of our culture, right? And our culture is a misogynist, capitalist, patriarchal culture that, that does treat women like shit. And it is a service industry, which again, you know, in the service industry that like every, my, it's a microcosm of the, the culture at large. So there is a lot of misogyny that happens. Um, but, you know, within, within the industry, there's also pockets where you can 
you know, make a living. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's any more misogynist than any other industry, I guess. There's a lot of, because it's unprotected, there's a lot of opportunity for abuse. Um, and there's not a lot of protections that are, you know, that like, there's no employee protections unless you're re really willing to fight for them. So in that way, it's, you're more vulnerable, but I don't think it's more misogynist or more racist than our culture at large. It just is a part of our culture. But that's my feeling. What about you guys? Monty, I feel like I've been talking a lot and I really do want to talk here, but I want to give you a second if you'd like to go. Thanks so much. I'll jump in. Um, uh, I mostly am not going to talk about the tax stuff because I'm not the expert on that. But here talking with friends, thinking, you know, that sex work is inherently misogynistic. I think Matilda's point is really important. I mean, it just our society just is misogynistic. And because, um, you know, sex work isn't protected, um, there's just some room to really mess up and really, really hurt some people. Um, but that doesn't mean that porn itself is misogynistic. There are some like really wonderful forward thinking, um, you know, uh, porn sites and like resources where you can like, you know, um, subscribe and, and everybody's paid fairly um, to be a part of this, um, this thing that can be beautiful and healing and helpful um, and a need that, that just, it does need to be filled. Um. Number one, I want to lift up just the joy of the internet for sex workers because it was not until Daisy Does Taxes and like stripper groups that I was able to find out that we can be writing off our heels and things like that. Like who knew we could actually be calling the club our workplace? No one tells you that. Um, so I would say the internet is how a lot of people have learned at least down here in the South, how we do our taxes. A lot of my friends previously were just like, no, I don't work. Don't worry about how I'm putting money in my bank. <laughs> like, and we're independent contractors. So it's so like, it's, you don't get caught for a while if, if you don't know. Um, and if you're careful, if you're not using a bank, for example, if you're only using like Venmo and things like that, or um, other like wallets online, you can skate by, but you have to be so careful. Um, in the other realm, I can't say better the way everyone else has said, we are on inherently misogynistic, sexist, anti-sex, anti-reproductive freedom, anti-body uh, land. Everything is stolen. That is what makes people hard here. They like it better when it's not by choice. Um, but there are so many creators on even Pornhub, on X Hamster, people do elect to do this work. Um, and I, I would center conversations with my friends who are really worried about the harms around the power, um, because like there is no escaping what is this land. There is a lot of work to be done if people are concerned about um, misogyny and like anti-women hate, like get your ass to the lobby rooms. Um, I, don't take it on sex workers, um, but uplift the fact that sex workers do create their own stuff there is like make love not porn um which a lot of my friends are on if you've ever so much as like lovingly took a little video of someone being romantic with you you have made porn and I don't think you identified as oppressed I think you felt freaky and happy and like loved um porn can be awesome where we are in the industry is heinous and that is the case with Hollywood, modeling, acting, working at McDonald's, anywhere. Our land is twisted. Thanks, y'all. Those were really nuanced and excellent answers. Um, if I can dig for another question or if anybody wants to, okay, cool, awesome. We're getting so many great questions. Um, so uh, Samantha is asking about FOSTA and SESTA. Um, and how that's impacted y'all or folks you know. But then also, and I think this is interesting, asking um, about future legislation and kind of like where things are headed now in the current like legislative climate. 
Um, and I would also love to hear about that if y'all have any knowledge. FOSTA and SESTA, really the impact was almost immediate. You know, um, around the world, adult sites, there, you know, sites where you could find, where you could find clients were shut down um, because the market in the U.S. is so big that even in like Craigslist Asia, you know, they were like, well, we, we have to shut it down because because of the US. Um, there's there's country specific and like city specific sites that are still unaffected or that are you know still going strong. Like our local Portland port is still up. Um, but overall, a lot of the really big sites just kind of blocked the US or else they shut down entirely. Um, and so there's there's the fewer screening um, sites. You can't screen as well, you can't, it's harder to find clients. Um, clients know that they have the advantage because there's more of us and we're all like, we need money. They want sex, but we need money. Um, and they're willing to use that to their advantage. And um, I think, you know, there's a, I think it might be hacking and hustling that tracks the rate of violence against sex workers and, you know, counted how many women were murdered or, you know, sex workers were murdered after FOSTA SESTA. Um, Cause there were a few really high profile ones like that April, May. And then I think the rate of violence has been pretty steady since then. Um, but there was something else I was gonna say about FOSTA SESTA, sorry. I totally, I got off on thinking about violence against sex workers and I got sidetracked. But um, yeah, it's, it's not been good. Um, and then what was the other part of the question? Kind of looking forward at where things are headed legislatively. And, you know, I should have, um, just for folks who are tuned in who maybe don't know, uh, named what FOSTA and SESTA are. Um, so just those acronyms are the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act and the Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act, um, which became law in 2018. Yeah. So what they did was they, um, there's a section of the internet code, I should know this, it's like section 230 and it protected um, platforms from being held liable for the speech of individual users on their platforms. And that had been protecting people who, you know, that had been protecting like Backpage um, and Craigslist. And um, so suddenly these sites were liable for any crimes that happened on them um, and, and they shut down, which is kind of unfortunate too, because like Backpage um, collaborated with law enforcement and helped take down a number of trafficking um, in, incidences, but you know, it's, it's messy. It's definitely messy. Right now, I am not like up to date on the anti-trafficking legislation, but I do know there's, you know, the, the TikTok ban that they're talking about. It actually affects internet freedom and free, free speech on the internet pretty heavily in ways, you know, that affect sex workers and other people. Um, and so I would encourage reading up on that for sure. And I know less about the history just because I was so young during this time period, um, just more so experienced the impact. Um, not only did Backpage get ripped from me very young, but then Tumblr changed dramatically. Um, I don't know if everyone remembers when Tumblr was like, oh, BT dubs, there's liabilities. Um, and we can't have you guys being your crazy selves on the internet anymore. Um, and so we all jumped off and went to Twitter. Uh, before Elon Musk had it. But the impact of that, I feel like that lingo, the we are looking out for trafficking lingo has been like pimped out essentially to all sorts of different places of the internet, um, both as a way to restrict sex workers from having freedom, but also I feel like it's bleeding into a lot of our reproductive freedom today and a lot of the legislation we're seeing today and a lot of the topics we're having about what we can access and what we can't. Like Matilda talked about TikTok, um, there's, and down to period tracker apps. Um, there are just so many places where we are no longer safe and the legislation is very, very tricky, but I feel like the dog whistle, and I feel comfortable calling it a dog whistle, the idea of looking out for trafficking, they, a, lot of, a lot of legislators are traffickers. A lot of, a lot of celebrities are traffickers, um, something we, haven't gotten to touch on a lot that is really intimate to my community is trans sex workers, like them being reported is a non thing. You see your friend put out the post and is like, don't take any calls from this celebrity. 
he has killed five of my friends. That's just that. And that's never going to go anywhere. People won't even believe their favorite celebrity was involved with a trans person in the first place, let alone a sex worker. Um, The absolute invisibility that happens, the more, like, if you live inside the margins of the margins in this work is uh, indescribable. But those dog whistles are really, really important when we're looking to the future. Um, I firmly believe that all of our struggles are connected. And I firmly believe what people are feeling now is what we were feeling before. I do want to speak. I just want to repeat that it is absolutely a dog whistle. This like care for our children who are being trafficked thing. This won't somebody think of the children. You're really just censoring adult consensual sex workers because we live in a we live in a society like we 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 you know our our society is very like anti sex um it's very like puritan you know in those kind of those like puritan roots and definitely uh not very friendly to women being in in positions of power because of that um but yeah this is uh, sex work is not sex trafficking period i want to add to that because like i would just pass a child labor law that lowers the age at which children it's just so obvious that it's a dog whistle and it's not about protecting you know protecting vulnerable people from exploitation it's just about creating these ways to oversee and police people and and just like further the carceral state like it's just it's so sad it's just very upsetting um where we're at right now yeah the language of trafficking is interesting too because we're seeing the right wing now pick that up and carry it into totally new areas like this whole abortion trafficking thing of the idea of like criminalizing reproductive care as a form of trafficking is so bizarre. I mean, it's such a wild leap, but, um, you know, and, and I don't know the, like the news I'm reading right now, you know, we're, we're kind of in this moment where you have state legislatures making it easier to employ children in industry. So the idea that this is about protecting children, right. Is, is a joke. Um, I, I thought it was interesting that in the book, Matilda, you at the beginning, you kind of say that you um, didn't initially even want to address trafficking in the text. Um, uh, but then of course you do go on to talk about trafficking, I, I imagine because it's it's kind of unavoidable. Um, mm-hmm. Would you be willing to share just a little bit about kind of that decision and, and um, maybe why you didn't want to talk about trafficking and ultimately decided that it was necessary? Also, I just want to name that I have never, so I'm not super well read in this area, perhaps, but I had no idea that the whole trafficking conversation was connected to the war on terror and George Bush. So that was yeah. super interesting to read about in the book. Thank you for that. Yeah, you're so welcome. I actually ended up enjoying writing that. But in the beginning, I was like, I am so, I'm so burned out and talking about trafficking because I used to do a lot more like legislative lobbying kind of work um and i would like show up to to policy meetings and just try to like give the sex worker perspective and it was so demoralizing it was i write about one instance in the book where i went to a meeting where a deputy da was like talking about um how how you can tell that someone's trafficked and the examples he gave were so racialized and so classed he was like acrylic nails hair weaves being in a certain um, low-income part of town um lipstick tattoos um you know and i was just like this is absurd like this is so crazy and he, he and then he went on to say that one of the like one of the ways that they get evidence against people is by threatening them you know threatening people close to them with being their trafficker because un- legally you know if you take money from a sex worker you can be their trafficker and so he talked about threatening tattoo artists who gave sex workers tattoos and be like you're going to go down as their trafficker if you don't like talk about this and then he the worst example to me was the condom example who's like if they have condoms on them condom possession the condoms were made in india and that's interstate commerce and that's trafficking and the whole thing was just so it was so absurd and so not rooted in best practices or like 
what real exploitation looks like. It was just exhausting. And that happened again and again and again. Um, we happened to be unfortunate enough to have shared Hope International, which is this big anti-trafficking organization just across the river from us in Vancouver, Washington. And they would come to meetings and it was just so smarmy and horrible. So I was like, I'm not talking about trafficking in my, this is my book. I'm gonna talk about what I want. And then I was like, oh, but really, if I don't, nobody's gonna understand what's actually happening. Like are the context of our lives is so framed by the trafficking conversation of the last 20 years, but I have to get into this. Um, I have to dig in, like, I have to explain what's going on. Otherwise you're just gonna be like, well, children are being kidnapped. What's wrong with you? Why do you, why are you against laws that protect children from being kidnapped? Um, so I did end up getting into it. And um, yeah, I just wanna say one of the contributors, Melissa Dittmore has a book that's coming out, um, I think on May 9th and it's called Unbroken Chains. And it's about the history of labor trafficking in the United States. And um, she helps me with stats in the introduction and a lot of the research and Unbroken Chains is just really incredible. She really drives home the fact that it, like from the very foundation of this country, our country was founded on trafficked labor, you know, and, and it just goes from there. And some of the things that she talks about are things that I didn't even know about. Like, yeah, it's just, this country is really wild. So that, did that answer your question? I'm sorry, I got kind of sidetracked. It did, it definitely did, thank you. Um, I wanna make space if anybody else wants to say anything about trafficking or the trafficking discourse. No, <laughs> totally fair. Um, Okay, well, another question that we got in the Q and A um, is from Jill, um, and I think this is this is a good one. I, first off, I really appreciate that part of the conversation tonight has been about the South. I feel like sometimes Camille, thanks for bringing that. Sometimes we we do events and we talk to like really smart people who are in other parts of the world or the country, and I feel like the context for our region gets a little lost. And the South is, I mean, I guess everywhere is unique, but you know. I live in the South, I'm very aware of the ways in which the South is unique. Um, but Jill was asking about this kind of regional experiential kind of difference. So curious about, um, you know, places where there are greater or less protections and um, how y'all see that impacting people's experience of doing sex work. Um, Jill mentioned specifically uh, places like Nevada in which there's been some degree of legalization. Can I do a, um, because I, I'm more versed on dancing, but they, oh geez, like a few years ago, all dancers became employers and employees in California. Um, and I left LA right before all that happened. And I came back to my home state of Texas, which is a beast in itself. Um, but yeah, just to be uh, held to, um, a schedule and be held as an employer with no benefits, by the way, <laughs> same, same deal, just way less, um, freedoms, um, in California versus the rest of the U S I think where dancing, you can, um, there's still that independent contractor, uh, status. Yeah. It's very different. I don't know if this is like related to the question at all, but I, one thing I noticed about places that seem to have more like open legislation for people to work how they need to work um, is it seems like the market changes dramatically. Like I used to dream of dancing in Portland because there were so many clubs, but then I realized very quickly that those same dancers were suffering like greatly um, and that they were like, more dancers and there were people inside the clubs and situations like that I think there's a lot of um a lot of competition and a lot of um white supremacy that comes up in places where everyone's allowed um that's the only thing I could think of I live here um I think um yeah, I to just speak to Portland for a second. There's so many clubs here, and you would think that it would make a difference. I mean, it does. It does make a difference. It's different than dancing other places, but just the fact that there's so many clubs, I think, kind of recreates the FOSTA-SESTA client dynamic in which, you know, there's just 
so many clubs, so many places to work, so many dancers. And the clubs are kind of, it doesn't take anything to open a strip club here. You know, you just open a bar and you decide you want to have dancers and that's it. And so a lot of people are like, I'm going to, you know, what's a good way to raise money? I'm going to add some naked ladies. I'm going to charge the naked ladies and people are going to come see the naked ladies and they'll pay for beer. And, you know, and it just, it's really easy to make money as a strip club owner and it's not easy to make money as a dancer here. And it's just like the white supremacy is off the charts. Um, even though, you know, it's, it's Portland, but Portland has its own specific brand of white supremacy that's really insidious. Um, but I, before I forget, I wanted to say that in Nevada, where, where like prostitution is legal, it's legal in certain counties in Nevada. It's not legal across the state. You have to be a certain distance from cities. You can't be in the city. Um, and you like, for example, you can't leave your, your brothel. You have to stay there for the duration of your shift. So you, um, if you leave, you have to like, have like somebody come with you, I think. Um, it's just the oversight is really intense and you're charged, you know, you're charged room and board and they take a cut of all of your money. So you can set your own prices, but you have to, when you're setting your prices, you have to think, okay, well, they're gonna take this much money, you know, so I should factor this in um, and you, you get checked. It's pretty invasive. You get checked for STIs consistently. Um, it's just, it's an interesting, it's an interesting model. Um, I don't think that I would enjoy it. Like, I don't, just the thought of being trapped in this little like trailer, uh, like 30 miles outside of Vegas or whatever the rules are, just sounds like kind of a nightmare to me. Um, and then, you know, you do a lineup, you have to do a lineup. The clients come in, they pick their girl, we, you go back. It just, um, yeah. I'm used to a lot more freedom than that, but it's, you know, for the people that it works for, I think it works really well for the people that it works for. <laughs> cool. And related, somebody's asking about terminology um, that, that we've used the term prostitution some in this conversation, partly because that's the term being used by folks asking questions. Um, there's also the term full service sex work. Um, which shows up often in the book. Um, would anybody be willing to like talk about those two terms and like if if there's a reason why you might use one or the other? Um, full service sex work is like the the nice like prostitution has a loaded history, you know, because it's like a crime and there's also value judgments inherent in prostitution. I use prostitute and prostitution for myself just because like it's really easy and clear what I'm talking about and I don't have to explain like whereas if I say like escort people are like what's an you know what do you mean by escort? Like I sell sex, I'm a prostitute. Um full service doesn't have the connotations that prostitute does. You know, it doesn't have the same value judgments and stigma attached. Unless, you know, you really think about what it means, which it means you're selling sex and there's still stigma attached. So that's why I don't really bother with it. But um, sometimes it still comes out. I kind of personally like um, when when someone says full service sex work, I know that they're educated and they're sensitive to like what it means. And they're like, I can see that they're putting an effort to put those, um, those value judgments aside. Whereas when I hear someone say prostitute, uh, if they're not using it on themselves, which is a reclamation of the word, side eye, <laughs> personally, I'm just, you know, I'm just seeing like where, not that it's a, a bad word or anything, or it's not the word to use. It's just, um, I see people who don't understand the full story using the word more often because it's the most accessible word. That's all, just two cents. I feel like I the know. most accessible word is whore, but we're not saying that, so. <laughs> I love the word whore. I use that word on myself, but I, I unless you are a whore, I mean, even if you're not a whore, you could be Christian Nancy and call me a whore and I'd be like, thank you, Nancy. See you <laughs> on Sunday. Ain't got good all the time, Nancy. You know, I would not be pressed, honestly. I'm not far removed. But I, I think when you're talking to marginalized groups, depending on which marginalized group, you might hear what you may think as a, of as a slur. Um, but sometimes that is just how we empower ourselves or like make ourselves feel at home. We use all kinds of lingo that we probably wouldn't want someone not inside the space to be using. Um, so I just want to, appreciate that you guys are noticing that and like giving us that space to be our horror selves.
Cool. Well, we've already talked a little bit about <clears throat> like um, organizing and activism, um, but there's a question here from Mark specifically about union organizing. Um, and Mark references um, union organizing work in the UK or maybe Britain specifically, um, and then is asking whether or not y'all have either been involved in any union organizing or maybe know people who have or um, have been kind of like um, involved with any campaigns as supporters. We are in a big moment for unions. There's a lot of really exciting work happening in California. Um, and there's the Strippers United, you know, and the No Host, no host Stripper, Stripper Strike, am I getting that right? Um, they are they are trying to form a union, and I think that they have got the National Labor Review Board, Labor Relations Board um, involved, and I'm pretty excited to see what happens with that. Um, and then locally, this club um, tried to fire some dancers, and the dancers went on strike, and they're like, they're just they're on strike. There's still there's still dancers at the club. It's kind of one of the difficulties about trying to organize strippers is that, you know, we're independent contractors. You know, it's it's hard. Um, so there's still people that are dancing in the club, but there's a lot of people that are on strike and the club is not getting new dancers. And that's, I'm really excited for that too. But um, really there's two pieces in the book that talk about unionizing um, and organizing the difficulties with it, because you know, you're in this closed market of a club, right? Where like all of the workers are competing for the same very finite pool of customers. And it's hard when like, that's hard all on its own. And then you get things like some girls make more money, you know, that like really skinny cis blonde white women make more money without with less effort than other people. And it's hard to create solidarity when there's that kind of dynamic happening too. Um, one of my friends wrote a piece in the book about white supremacy and organizing. And I just, I just really love that she put a name to that because it's not something that gets talked about all that often. Um, just the difficulties with trying to create solidarity in such a space, you know, it's really hard. It's really hard to create like camaraderie and trust. You know, there's like superficial relations where, yeah, you're looking at each other's buttholes and checking for each other's tampon strings. But at the same time, when it comes down to it, you're all fighting for the same customers and the same pool of money. And that can make it things really taxing. Um, so it's, it's really hard. And I just admire the people who are doing it so much. I'm rooting for them. I, I'd like to, um, uh, because there are, there are some people that I know from Stripper Strike, No Hope, who are doing amazing work. And I love the idea of there being like more protection for dancers, love that. That is absolutely something that I could have done with. Um, <laughs> and then there are a lot of friends who are, against it uh, because they are dancing or they're doing sex work um, because of, you know, uh, I, I mean, they're like, hmm, there's a myriad of reasons, but like maybe they're undocumented or maybe they like need to be like they they can't get you know a regular job or something like that. And they are, you know, they're survival sex workers and um, those friends are saying um, that they're not really a fan of unionizing because then it puts them on the map, it puts them in danger, uh, it puts them under the eye of um, our justice system who, even if we're unionized, like in their eyes, we're still like dirty prostituting whores, you know, and all the, the negative stigma that comes with those words um, and not worth saving or that we've asked for it and, and blah, blah, blah. So um, my heart is is really torn um, here. I just wanted to leave some space for you. Yeah. So, I, guess I think I'm it's so okay. Oh, sorry, Camille, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Cool. My you. piece is just about dreaming. Honestly, like I don't, I don't have any like real context, but I have always, always, always dreamed of having a strip club, like being a club owner and being one of those losers. But on top of like my club, having an international workers of the world so that inside our club, we have like built in labor union. We get to like have nonprofit status and like do the damn thing. And also like make the money, you know, like just chill. Um, I've always just thought in my brain where everything is smooth brain and nothing hurts and there is no oppression, 
um, that that works so well. And that's somewhere where I live constantly, where I have an international workers of the world titty bar. <laughs> I love that. I want that. After the revolution, we're gonna have it. I'm working the there. Real left this want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about art um mel is asking about pieces of art that really resonated for y'all um uh and you know this is really woven into the book for anyone who hasn't picked the book up yet i think a lot of the, the you know the interview format pieces ask about music in particular um but yeah, uh, in response to Mel's question, um, Mel would love to hear about songs, poetry, visual art, et cetera. And there is some great visual art in this book. You guys, I'm not an artist. I mean, I'm kind of an artist, but I'm not like a real artist, so. I know, <laughs> but if I don't come with like names and receipts, like this will mean nothing. So I like have to look for, um, there's this one oil painter that I love that paints like, um religious figures as like gay and trans sex workers and they're like these huge oil paintings but if I don't have a name like what does that matter but I'm just you know I'm having a brain fart let me let me scroll and when I find it I'm coming back um I'm really into this Australian artist SJ Norman who um is I think doing something in New York this week, actually, but um, he did this incredible piece where he uh, had someone carve into his back the amount of indigenous people who had been killed in custody in a given year. Um, he's an indigenous artist and he's also a writer and he wrote a book of short stories that I love called um, Permafrost. Um, and so that's something that I've been into. Um, and then, I'm not very good with visual art. I'm like, I like pretty pictures. You know, I like comics. I'm not like complicated. Um, so I, I always feel uncomfortable and really plebeian, but uh, the comics, I like Ms. Marvel. <laughs> I love Ms. Marvel so much. Um, and there's a comic coming out soon that I was really excited about, but I'm totally spacing on the name now. Um, I love art. Um my favorite intersection of art to follow is very squarely in activism art. I have a collection of Black Panther art, like just like a novel of it. Um, I also have like a beautiful painting on my wall of like a Black woman sewing, but she's like melting in the reflection. I love depictions of like, as Monty put it, like the, the feminine experience, but also like the human experience, like as a queer person, um, there are like experiences I have as a person who has like a thin body, but then there are experiences that I have as like a genderqueer person. Um, Girls of Words is like a queer poetry Instagram that I follow religiously. And for some people, like the things they write, like a girl is born under the knife, things like that. They don't love to see that and don't understand, but especially in like the dollification of America where everybody is getting facial feminization surgery, whether you are born a girl, already a girl, whatever's happening. Um, I live for the fact that we are normalizing all of these experiences that were once just for one person. Again, pulling back to you, all of our struggles are connected, but um, I live for that stuff. I love, I love, love, love written work. Um, and I think this is a good place to plug Adri Rose, who is already in the book. Um, I've been following Adri Rose for a little bit, Adri Rising. I, everything that person has ever put on the internet, I have read a hundred times over and bookmarked and posted. Um, I think a piece that they wrote that really, really challenged me, however, was around pimps. Um, and their take was so not what I wanted to hear, even as an abolitionist. I think a lot of people who are on the path of abolition struggle with uh, moving away from kill your heroin dealer or like kill all pimps because that is not necessarily going to fix anything. Pimps will continue being born every day and we will be mass genociders at that point. Um, 
but Adi Rose really contextualized and like humified the experience and how to keep fighting and honoring your truth while also not fighting for demolition of our, our existence. Um, and I, I cannot recommend A.G. Rose enough if you wanna be challenged. Oh, thank you for that. Being challenged is like, what art is for? I finally found that name, side note, um, Fabian Chiarez. That's C-H-A-I-R-E-Z, a -E uh, master. Yeah, the, the, um, the like, just the gay turn of religious figures is ugh, so healing weirdly um and it's also like it it also has a lot to do with mexican culture too so there's also like addressing the machismo and all of that so um it really like takes this like straight patriarchy and turns it on its head which is my favorite favorite activity <laughs> Awesome. And since Camille brought up um, abolitionism, I guess um, I'd love to hear how abolitionism shows up in this in this book, um, or how y'all see um, abolitionism abolitionism as kind of like relevant uh, to your activism. I think I've been having some really interesting conversations around abolitionism. A friend of mine brought up the other day that she wishes a certain sexual abuser would get punished. And that started this whole conversation about, well, is that carceral? Like, is that abolitionist of you to, to want to see your abuser punished? And I think it's just, it's we're at this, we're at this interesting time where we're talking more about like abolitionism and, and restorative justice and transformative justice, but we aren't there, you know? Like we we don't have these solutions yet. We're still discussing them. And and how do like how do we deal how do we deal with the ugly emotions that come up after trauma and how do we deal as communities with with people who've harmed other people you know especially if you know they don't really seem to show remorse <laughs> um, or you know or even if they do show remorse like what how do you work with that um, and then like there's this specific this I don't know whether this is specific to Portland's problem I feel like it's a very Portland problem but it's probably anywhere there are white people um where you know people in Portland are really uncomfortable with people of color being multifaceted and potentially being abusers and we had this group here in Portland that was an abolitionist group that bailed out um people of color and most unfortunately they bailed out a domestic abuser who went on to kill his partner or his ex-partner um, after being bailed out because they didn't do their due diligence. They were just like, oh, it's, you know, a man of color, we should bail him out. And I, I just think, you know, our, <laughs> what are we doing that something like that happened? You, you know, like, that's, that's not abolitionism. That, I mean, that's just fucked. Like, we fucked up. Um, so I, I've been having lots of emotions around abolitionism. But I mean, you know, I support it the sex industry is so criminalized and so so stigmatized that like the only abolitionism is the only answer for me it's just you know have, having these conversations and how to how to enact justice is this continuing mess i think but we're you know we're working on it we're doing it abolition is like a grounding place for me especially because as matilda said in society we're not there that is not it's a framework that we dream of it's not something that we get to live in um sex workers have no access to uh basic health care or basic community safety outside of what we provide for ourselves and what our friends will provide to us um i think what is always missing i really love that you named white supremacy there because it's saviorism that i'm hearing over actually centering people who are harmed and moving from what people are asking for. If we were centering the harmed and moving from what they would say, I mean, we have seen time and time and time and time again, abuse people who have been abused have been like, I can deal with this. I have dealt with this. I have talked to this person. You can let them go. This is not justice. Um, 
But if we were centering people, we could find that stuff out and we could move from there and people could be having the conversations they want to have or, or seeing the, the justice that they want to see. Um, for some people, it's not always punitive or carceral. carceral. It, now, unless you consider like not having access to a person again punitive, which it can be, um, but also that's a healthy boundary if, if something dangerous has happened, if, if harm has happened. Um, what I think gets lost in the sauce of abolition is people forget about the people involved. It, it's a lot of theory. We should not just be mass bailing people out unless we know what's going on. Um, of course, abolish all prisons. And I can say that I, I don't mean this flippantly, but I definitely was outside of the prison that my abuser was inside of saying, we see you, we love you. Like, and I thought it was so funny. And in my heart, I was kind of living because I was like, well, look at you, you awful, me, compassionate, caring. <laughs> I'm out here looking for you and you did what? <laughs> but for me, like no one who's ever abused me won. Look at me, I'm still here, still pretty unbothered. Um, and I, I have always been able to achieve my own ideas of justice inside myself. Um, and I've had no choice because there is no other way to get justice for me. In, even if I wasn't a sex worker. My proximity to justice as a Black queer is just non-existent. Um, so as Matilda said, there's just no other way to be. Um, but that is not without acknowledging like the imperfections and the fact that we are just dreaming still. We aren't in the final stages. I really can't say that any better. Um... Oh, oh my God. I love that for you, Camille. Fuck. And it's like, it's like, um, you're just like repeating what my entire mantra for this, for, for my piece, my billboard. I mean, I painted it so many years ago, but it really is like, you have to find your own forms of justice in the system that we have now. Y'all believe it or not, we're, we're kind of out of time. Um, things went by real fast. Uh, maybe we can kind of go out with final thoughts. Um, and if nothing is at the front of your mind, maybe you can tell folks who have tuned in, mm, maybe like share some ways that folks can show up for and support like sex workers in their local community. But don't be limited. You can say anything you want, um, but final round. Um you should donate, you can show up to for sex workers by donating to sex worker mutual aid funds. Um, the one I can think of right off the top of my head is Lysa Strata, which is a national fund. Like sex workers from all across the country can get help from them. Um, Red Canary Song is a really great group in New York. Um, I think I'm blanking on the name of the one in the Bay Area. I think it's Bay Area Mutual Aid. Um, but yeah, those are the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. And you should just like, buy the book, obviously, but also talk about sex work. Like just talk about it with your friends and, and don't, don't get weird. Um, it's, it's a normal, it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a job. Um, it's a kind of a shitty job. Sometimes, sometimes it's a great job. It's complicated, but, um, yeah, just like normalize it, I guess is my thing. Um, and definitely, definitely buy the book because the more copies that sell, the more likely sex workers are to keep getting book deals and get their words out there. And that's important. It's important, especially for small press books. Yes, thank you for putting this panel together. This was so wonderful. Um, I love speaking with other sex workers and hearing what you all have to say. We are so fucking smart. <laughs> I love like being next to you and like really feeling like um, almost spoken for sometimes like um, both of your work Camille and Matilda means so much to me. Um, thank you for doing what you do and for inviting me um, and uh, thank you Firestone Books for helping us put on this um, this panel as well and reaching out to all these wonderful people. It's been great talking with you. If you want to follow me if you want to follow me, you can go on Instagram to at Monty Monster Slayer. Um, you can also find my work at stephaniemonty.art and just check out what cool stuff I got coming up.
Um, I'm about to follow you right now, first of all. And second of all, echoing the sentiment of just extreme gratitude. It is so exciting that I get to be in a panel about being a whore. It is extremely like life-giving for me. Um, and if you want to support sex workers in general, keep in mind the intersections of sex work. You may not feel extremely empowered in like donating directly to someone's only fans or like supporting their sexy posts on Instagram. However, um, I know we got a question about opiate support. Supporting your local um, harm reduction collective, supporting your local um, abolitionist bail fund, your bail fund, please support your bail fund if you wanna help sex workers. Um, there are so many different places where we are existing that people don't think about. Um, and that's what the capitalist world lives off of is disappearing people that they don't want here anyway. Um, so keep us visible. Heart our sexy post. Don't be afraid of it. Um, keep us visible. Don't let us get shadow banned and disappeared. That was a fantastic note to end on. With apologies to folks who submitted comments and questions that we didn't get to. It's been a great night. Um, and I hope that I'll get to meet all of y'all in person someday soon. Especially you, Camille. We're so close. Thank Take care, y'all. So Bye.